What is going on, A Push Peeps? We have period five in 10 minutes for you today. This one covers from 1844 to 1877. Before we begin, it is shout out time. Shout out to Mrs. Lance's class at North High School. Thank you for watching. I appreciate your support. All right, let's get started with U.S. expansion, Manifest Destiny. Know it, it is mentioned in the new curriculum. This was based, according to the new curriculum, on racial and cultural superiority. Be familiar with this painting, which depicts Colombia expanding out west. It is the main focus of political debates in the 1840s and the 1850s, because as the U.S. Expand is expanding, the number one question will be, will that land be free or slave? So as the U.S. is acquiring territory, look at things like the Mexican-American War, which produces the Mexican Cession, which increases the size of the U.S. by one-third. There are enormous debates over slavery, things like the Wilmot Proviso, which proposes that all slavery be banned in the Mexican territory. This does not become a law, but it is an idea. So what is the impacts of expansion? Well, we have environmental changes and settlement on Indian lands, and this leads to conflict and treaty violations with the natives. And there's a picture of David Wilmot, the author of the Wilmot Proviso. We also have the U.S. beginning ex initiatives towards Asia, especially for economic reasons like Matthew Perry, who goes over to Japan, and cultural reasons as well, including missionaries or the spread of Christianity. Now we have, we're going to shift our focus to older immigrants during this time period, which tended to live in ethnic communities, and we have those that are German and Irish that make up the bulk of old immigrants. The Irish tend to settle in cities, and the Germans tend to settle on frontier as farmers. It came to America pre-Civil War. That's what separates them from the new immigrants who will be post-Civil War, we'll talk about later. They face nativism, which is fear, discrimination, hatred of foreigners, and especially the Irish because they were Catholic. And then this nativist movement was anti-Catholic and sought to limit the power and influence of these immigrants. Think of the Know Nothing Party, which was established to keep Catholics from holding office. There were many opportunities out west during this time period, and it increased due to legislation promoting economic development. That's a key point to know, that the federal government is encouraging westward expansion. Think of things like the Homestead Act, and here's a picture of the Homestead Act. It gave 160 acres of cheap land to move out west to families that would settle there for five years. Now, not always was this land the best. So what are impacts of expansion, whether it's migrant or territorial? Well, we have conflicts with Hispanics and natives. An example is the Sand Creek Massacre, in which a Colorado militia attacked the Cheyenne Indians and killed over 100. Most of them were women and children. And we also have Little Bighorn, which is also known as Custer's Last Stand, in which the natives attacked and killed Custer and his men. This was one of the few successes in conflicts for the Native Americans. All right, we're going to jump on over to northern and southern differences. North during this time had free labor manufacturing, and the south was dependent on agriculture and slavery. They had a very slow population growth because people are not moving to the south and competing with slavery. As a result, the north had more power in the house, which is why the Wilmot Proviso passes the house, but not the senate. Abolitionists begin to emerge during this time. They are a minority or small number in the North, but they had a visible campaign. They used things like fierce arguments. Dudes like William Lloyd Garrison here wrote his weekly newspaper, The Liberator. They also helped slaves escape, think of the Underground Railroad, and they used violence, think of people like John Brown as well. So how did the South defend slavery in the face of the abolitionist movement? Well, people like John C. Calhoun argued that slavery was a positive good. And they also used nullification, the belief that states could declare federal laws unconstitutional, that states had lots of rights to defend this institution. And furthermore, they used racial stereotypes, things like minstrel shows, which stereotyped and mocked African Americans. All right, compromises and the election of 1860, definitely know this page. So what were various attempts? Failed attempts at solving the issue of slavery. Well, you have the Compromise of 1850. This is a result of the land gain from the Mexican Session. We got my boy Henry Clay here. It instituted popular sovereignty in the Mexican Session and a strict fugitive slave law, which will greatly upset the North and lead many to, to join the abolitionist movement. The Kansas-Nebraska Act led to bleeding Kansas, and this overturned the Missouri Compromise and instituted popular sovereignty in Kansas and Nebraska. The Dred Scott decision was an 1857 Supreme Court case, which ruled that Congress could not legislate slavery in the territories. I do have detailed videos on all three of these. Check them out in the description below. So the second party system, the Whigs and the Democrats, that ends due to issues over slavery, 
and anti-immigrant nativism, nativism, again, think of the Know Nothing Party. And we see the emergence of sectional parties, especially Republicans in the North and Midwest. Specifically mentioned, please know that the Republicans start as a sectional party. Now, in the election of 1860, that's when Abe Lincoln wins, he was elected on a free soil platform, which meant that the slavery would not expand. So slavery was fine where it is, it just could not expand beyond that. And this is the immediate cause of secession. South Carolina secedes about a month later, and that ultimately leads to the Civil War. Okay, let's talk about the Civil War now, the Union victory. The North and the South both mobilized their economies and societies for the war effort, even in the face of serious opposition. Both instituted conscription or a draft. Lincoln suspended habeas corpus in Maryland to those that criticized the war effort, and he shut down many newspapers. The Emancipation Proclamation, know this as in the new curriculum, it changed the purpose of the war. It was no longer just to preserve the Union. And this helped keep Europe out of the war. And it also led to African Americans being able to fight in the Union Army. And this could be compared with the Gettysburg Address, which hints at a new birth of freedom. So why did the Union succeed? Well, they had improved military leadership, people like Grant and Sherman. They had effective strategies like the Anaconda Plan here, which was a blockade. And they had key victories like Antietam, which led to the Emancipation Proclamation and Gettysburg. They also had greater resources, more factories, more railroads, more population. And the South was destroyed as a result of the war. Think of Sherman's march to the scene, which much of the South's infrastructure and environment was destroyed. All right, we're going to jump to Reconstruction. 13th Amendment abolished slavery. This was drastic social and economic change. However, the South tried to get around this by instituting things like sharecropping, which had conditions very similar to slavery. Radical Republicans were a group that emerged during this time, and they sought to change the balance of power between Congress and the president. Think of something like the impeachment of Andrew Johnson. Former slaves and African Americans gained political opportunities. Hiram Revels was the first African-American elected to Congress. So you see quite a few number of African-Americans, men who are elected to Congress. And the word waning, and there's Hiram Revels, the word waning means to reduce. And by the 1870s, the North's resolve for Reconstruction was waning, or the North's desire to pursue Reconstruction policies decreased. Please be familiar with that. Now, the Compromise of 1877 ended Reconstruction and the military was withdrawn from the South and Rutherford B. Hayes becomes president. I have a video on that. Check it out in the description if you want more. The 14th Amendment provided citizenship and equal protection of the laws. It's a very key part of this Amendment. I do have a video on the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. The 15th Amendment granted suffrage for men. So you see all men being able to vote here, and this was aimed specifically at African Americans. However, African American rights were still limited during this time through the following. You have segregation, Jim Crow laws, which allowed for separate facilities. You have violence, groups like the KKK and the White League emerge, which terrorized African Americans. The Supreme Court also helped limit African-American rights through things like Plessy versus Ferguson, which established the separate but equal doctrine, and also the civil rights cases, which stated that the government cannot stop private, in, private businesses or individuals from discrimination, and local political tactics, including poll taxes, literacy tests, and grandfather clauses, which were created to limit the number of African-Americans who could vote. So what were the impacts of these amendments on women's rights? Please know that this is a key part of the new curriculum. It split the group. Some of them only advocated the 15th Amendment if it would include women, people like Elizabeth, Katie Stan, and Susan B. Anthony, and others argued that the amendment should be passed because African Americans had suffered long enough. Now, these amendments were stalled for many decades. But eventually, in the 1950s and 1960s, this is a great connection across time, which the new AP curriculum loves to do. These amendments will be used to help out the civil rights movement. We'll see that when Brown versus Board overturns Plessy versus Ferguson. All right, we'll do a quick recap. Manifest Destiny and its Impacts, know it especially as it relates to slavery. Mexican-American War and debates over slavery, think of the Wilma Proviso. Immigrants and nativism, how did they face discrimination? Abolitionist tactics, be familiar with three of them. That's like a great short answer question. Compromise of 1850, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, Dred Scott, know all of them and how they ultimately all failed. The election of 1860 and Lincoln's platform as a free soiler, what did that lead to? The Emancipation Proclamation and how it changed the war. 
everything about the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, and the end of Reconstruction and the word waning. Don't forget waning. All right, short answer practice for you. Answer all three parts. Briefly explain one political or social impact brought about by one of the Reconstruction Amendments. Briefly explain one way Southern society sought to limit the power of the amendment chosen in Part A. And C, briefly explain why Southern societies were or were not successful in limiting the amendment using specific historical evidence. All right, guys, thank you very much for watching. I look forward to seeing you right back here for period six in 10 minutes. We're going to get into this guy, Booker T. Washington. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the section below. And please check out my other videos, including my massive period one through five review video in the description and six through nine as well. They are great resources for both midterms and finals. And best of luck this year. I do appreciate your support. Look forward to seeing you right back here for period six. Thank you very much and have a good day.